Welcome everyone to CG webinar number 286 and a welcome opportunity to dive deeply into the research handbook on university rankings, theory, methodology, influence and impact published by Edward Elgar, which is uh, out and about a very good collection, a kind of state of the art on university rankings and from all angles. Uh, and um, and we've got with us in the uh, webinar today, Ellen Hazelcorn and, and Georgia Mihut, who were the editors of the handbook. But um, I think only Ellen will be presenting in, the, in, this, in this segment. And we've also got with us uh, uh, Leslie Chan and um, just a minute, George Chen, apologies for that little delay. Uh, and I'll introduce them in a moment. Uh, but let me take you through the webinar protocols first. Now, remember that the webinar is being recorded uh, and uh, you'll be able to access it through our CG website and our YouTube channel within the next 48 hours or so. We'll also post the public dimension of the chat conversation from today on our website. Now, during the webinar, please keep yourself muted uh, unless you've been asked to speak or ask a question. We do find that extraneous noise can interrupt the webinars. And there's no need to have your video on either during the webinar. Um, but we recommend you using speaker view in the top right hand corner there so you can more clearly see who is talking during the webinar. To ask a question, and we do have a substantial Q&A segment, uh, which will begin after about half an hour, uh, use the chat function, post your question or any statement you'd like to make in response to the presentations in the chat, and I'll select uh, speakers into the Q&A part of the webinar from, what, from what's coming in the chat. Um, when you're asked to speak, and I'll send you a little warning in, 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 in the chat beforehand, um, please turn on your mic, turn on your video and state who you are and where you are from as the first thing you say. Well, it's a pleasure to introduce our presenters today, Ellen Hazelcorn, a longstanding colleague of ours at Centre for Global Higher Education, where she serves on the advisory board as well as the Research Management Committee and is a researcher in our program, is the co-editor of Research Handbook on University Rankings. She's the joint managing partner at BH Associates in Dublin and a Professor Emeritus of the Technical Technological University Dublin. Very well known for her um, commentary on rankings, but really Ellen is across a wide range of issues in tertiary education and has a very active role um, as a policy consultant and advisor around the world. With her today, we've got Leslie Chan, who's an Associate Professor in the Department of Global Development Studies and Director of the Knowledge Equity Lab at the University of Toronto Scarborough. He's got a long-standing interest uh, in, in teaching and research interest in understanding the geopolitics of knowledge production and uneven power relations embedded and reproduced by this production, something we talk about a lot in the CG webinar program. And with um, Ellen and, and, and Leslie, we've got George Chen, George is a law student at Harvard Law School in the US. His research interests include the economics of higher education, specifically as it affects research and teaching, the, Angli the academic publishing industry, and inequality in knowledge representation. Again, issues of great interest to many of us. Um, so we look forward to hearing from all three, and we begin with Ellen. I hand over to Ellen now. OK, thanks, Simon. Hi, everyone. So I'm going to make a few opening remarks. Um, we talk a lot about rankings. They emerged at the beginning of the millennium. It's hard to know. Um, we think about it like that, coinciding with deepening economic integration across the world economy. This place has placed a premium on research, development, and innovation, RDI, and focused on new products, technologies, and services, and on talent. Based on, these, on the increasing value of these products for competitiveness and national prestige, higher education and research have been deliberately moved to the center of policymaking and referred to as an investment. Previously, education was captured as a social expenditure. The geopoliticalization of higher education and research describes a process of strategic targeting of higher education 
for political and economic advantage in much the same way as, for example, trade and investment policy. Global rankings captured this zeitgeist um, perfectly, highlighting and amplifying comparative and competitive advantages and disparities between inherently diverse and unequal systems and institutions. While higher education institutions jockey for high rank, being in the rankings tent is always better than being on the outside looking in. These developments underpin the necessity for systems of international comparability, the importance of data and the use of um, quantitative indicators for measurement and comparison stretch back to the foundations of the modern nation state and the process of statecraft in the late 19th century. In the global era, perceptions of quality and status depend on measurability. Almost 100 such indices have been produced since 1990. Rankings are just part of this trajectory. The success lies in publicly and effectively challenging national, university, and individual claims of excellence. Without the data and systems, academics, institutions, and governments have relied on self-assertion, prestige factors, and institutional or national self-data, self-reported data. Rankings have challenged those assumptions in ways that quality assurance and other national bound systems could never do. The growing use of digital platforms and AI driven analytics, along with the shift to open science, has transformed the process of conceptualizing, collecting, managing, warehousing, publishing, and analyzing higher education and research information. Over recent years, there's been an exponential growth in the number and type of platforms, systems, and instruments, and a whole array of people and organizations interested in this type of information for strategic and other purposes. These developments help explain the close bond between rankings, publishers, and data analytics. The recent acquisition of US-based Inside Higher Ed by the Times Higher Education goes a, goes a step further. Not only does it create a global higher education news powerhouse, it facilitates Times Higher Education access to the world's richest higher education market, what didn't seem to work out when it linked up with, um, with, um, with another journal, uh, Wall Street Journal. Understanding and using data is essential to being and staying competitive. Governments and universities which embrace an evidence-based decision-making approach are much more likely to outperform institutions that make decisions based on belief. Conversely, without such information, it's not possible to govern, develop, and or monitor systems or institutions. The global intelligence business has created vast data lakes containing triple digit billions of data elements usually held behind paywalls. Owning rich data resources, as well as the smart tools to capture and interpret them is where the real money and power lies. Arguably governments in higher education have effectively outsourced and, and privatized the collection and management of public data. Indeed, it's bewildering that we are so keen to give our data away for free tempted by the possibility that we too may be ranked. Questions are only beginning to be asked about data ownership, governance and regulation of higher education research data. In much the same way, questions are already being asked about big tech. Which brings us to today's seminar, webinar. Until recently, too little attention was focused on rankings as a business and especially on the growing corporate integration and economic concentration between rankings, publishing, and big data. This webinar draws on this important, on an important chapter in the research handbook, uh, which um, Simon mentioned, and just to put it up here, um, three of the chapters and uh, three of the 37 chapters in the book um, address this issue. And there is a special discount um, for participants today. So Leslie and George um, are going to use Elsevier as an example and map this intersection between rankings, publishing, and sophisticated end-to-end software, which, which accumulates and manages data across the entire academic knowledge production cycle from conception to publication. I think you're in for a real treat of information. 
um, on to you, um, Leslie and George. I'm on, I assume? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, good afternoon, morning, or evening to all of you. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Hayes Korn and Dr. Mehut for, uh, the, first of all, inviting us to take part in uh, writing a chapter for the handbook and uh, also to take part uh, in this webinar, which is uh, based on the chapters that we uh, contributed to the handbook and to the Center for Global Higher Education for hosting this uh, uh, that this, this seminar, and, and of course, as Professor Marcheson also mentioned, uh, we're, we're pleased to be part of this series because, again, the, the, the recurring themes about uh, global inequality and in knowledge production and representation is very much uh, why we were interested in uh, engaging in this research in the first place. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to go through some of the broader contextual uh, uh, reasons for us to get involved or got into the rabbit hole of, of, of university rankings. Uh, again, beginning with our interest in, in uh, global knowledge productions in, in general. Uh, so I'm going to give a very macro level overview, including some of the conceptual frameworks, uh, uh, some of which have already been alluded to by, by Alan in terms of this surveillance form of uh, business model. Uh, and and uh, then um, George will uh, drill down to the more ma micro level uh, operations, uh, particularly of the big company, many of you know Elsevier, which is uh, oft often known as a publisher, but it is in fact a data analytic company uh, and their relationship with time, Times Higher Education University World uh, Rankings. And of course, and very much in the news all the time. And so George will dig into uh, their relationship uh, and some of the problematic uh, 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 kind of business uh, relationship that we should be asking questions about. Uh, and so we will conclude by drawing some of these questions to, to uh, more public discussions. Uh, and again, not necessarily we don't have the answers to that, but again, to raise awareness of some of the some of the unknown or little little discussed issues that very much uh, part of our day to day uh, experience within the university, but we don't know why they happen or why we're doing what we're doing. So so we we really want to raise question about them. So as I said, um, we we started off looking at, at ranking not because we were interested in ranking, but because we we're interested in broadly about. Uh, a, the, the, the very highly unequal global production system, uh, particularly in uh, academic uh, journal productions, uh, that it is uh, largely dominated by uh, publications from the global north uh, that are also uh, largely owned and operated by uh, legacy publishers also from the global north. And so we've been interested in understanding what these kind of asymmetry, this highly uh, uh, unequal power asymmetry means in terms of whose knowledge uh, gets circulated within academia, what our students learn, uh, what we know about the world through what we learn in universities, and how much we are missing from the world's knowledge when we don't, when we don't have exposure to the vast uh, wealth of knowledge from around the world. So. Uh, uh, where I've been working uh, uh, with colleagues, I've been looking at whether open access could be a means to disrupt this asymmetry. And we naively thought in the early days of the web that, that the open access is going to change everything. It's going to equalize the playing field. It's going to restructure the world of knowledge production. But as it turned out, fast forward 20 years, uh, that kind of knowledge inequality has actually been exacerbated and then uh, by open access by or, or rather by a distorted version of open access that is now turning into a business model of pay to publish and, and the publisher has been very clever you have to say in terms of turning these business opportunity to further entrench their existing power structures uh, and their stranglehold on the infrastructures and where we publish and how we circulate knowledge. So, so, so they are in effect reconfiguring 
the university in a very fundamental way and how we uh, how we dispense our labor, how we spend our time. Most of us wake up, you know, really reviewing paper, writing paper for the publishers. So then we can get the reputations in order to, 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 to thrive in, in the ac academic world. And so we, we have a strange system where we are now serving the industry, uh, a publishing industry rather than <laughs> publishing industry serving us. Uh, and so uh, we, our research is really looking at how they gain such power to make us all work for them. Uh, not only do we all work for them, they're able to take all the resources and asset and data and all that, build massive infrastructures uh, and continue to dictate how we uh, operate both within university and how we behave in terms of how we do research, how we publish, uh, how we focus our attention on what topic. But fundamentally too, this remember to, that, that these companies are uh, not just publishing company, as I referred earlier, they're data analytics company whose parent companies are often uh, private industry, but particularly private equity firms. Uh, and, and, and George will go a little bit more detail on some of the implications of this. Um, and so as we start to kind of examine these kind of uh, power structure, uh, we, we, we try to think about concepts and framework that help us uh, make sense of all these power. Uh, and if, if we look at some of the literature and political science, particularly Professor Susan Strange work on structural power that has a lot to remind us about how corporations are able to create uh, norm setting uh, 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 agenda. Uh, that is that the, 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 the way to acquire power is not simply through market dominance, but through market dominance, you could set up uh, the ability to set norms and standards. Uh, so again, a good reminder is that the, the journal impact factors, uh, the university ranking we're talking about, these are all owned and operated by private sector, private equity firms, private industries, uh, who then set up these norms that we as academics have to live by within the public institutions. Uh, and these norms and standards are increasingly being set in code and embedded in infrastructure. Uh, and so this so-called surveillance capitalism is a business model where uh, personal data of all sorts are being mashed up and created, generated into targeted products that can then be resold to individuals and institutions at much, much, much higher values and prices. Uh, and so all the data analytics based on publishings and so forth uh, are being slurped up by these massive infrastructures uh, that are being uh, amassed by the private sectors, uh, publishers, and later data analytic companies. Um, and, and again, as I said, much of these are now driven by algorithms and, and big data that are not transparent to any of us. We don't know how, who, who write these, uh, uh, what the norms of, uh, the, the, uh, of success and, and criteria these, these algorithms are after. Uh, but our, our information are being uh, remixed in these kind of uh, large data lake that Alan referred to. Uh, I just want to mention that I haven't put all the relevant references to all these work uh, in, this, in these slides. It's just too complicated, but you can go to our chapter and then we do have a preprint and a full bibliography uh, and it will be at the end of this presentation. You get the link there. You can see, look, look up all the references. But I just want to shout out to an upcoming book by uh, uh, Sarah Landon, who is writing a book on called Data Cartels, with particular focus on library vendors and publishers. Uh, how every move we make, how we search, we do on a library platform now. And again, George will talk about the recent uh, acquisition of ProQuest how everything we do are being tracked by these companies so that they not only have data of where we publish and so forth, but who we read, who we share information with, everything is being tracked uh, uh, it to, to the minute details. Okay, so having laid that sort of broad framework, I wanna now oh, remind ourselves too, that this publishing industries, and I mean, we talk about the dominance of the legacy publishers, uh, this study was done a few years ago that shows that five major publishers uh, have really dominated much of global uh, academic knowledge production. And that number is, is continued to rise, as we'll see. 
Uh, and the, the other broad conceptual framework that we draw from in this work by a geographer named Passi on the academic capitalism, and he reminds us that uh, a lot of these structural powers are not working in isolation. So the power of the publishers uh, are really deeply embedded with the global system of norm setting that involve multiple forms of institutions, uh, the World Bank, the, 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 world, uh, uh, the, uh, the International Monetary Fund, the World Economic Forum. These are all norm setting organization at the, uh, uh, at the multilateral level that sets the kind of standards, if you will, the kind of educations and policy standards that then being reinforced at the, at the local level and the international level by the publishing company, uh, particularly uh, focus that we have today is looking at uh, Elsevier and the time higher education rankings. Uh, again, I apologize for not having time to go through all the specifics, but uh, I wanna turn over now to George, give you the nitty gritty details uh, of Elsevier's and the time higher educations. George. Thank you, Leslie. So first, uh, let's talk about the, the profitability behind the Times Higher Education, uh, which was initially a subsidiary of uh, TSL Education owned by uh, Rupert Murdoch's news group. Uh, and the repeated sales to private equity at the bottom of the chart, you can really see the, the involvement of business uh, constantly throughout. And while over this long period of time before 2018, there were classroom learning related acquisitions, these were all ultimately sold a part of a different group because there is this split in 2018 that really demonstrates the profitability of a THE as a ranking due to its separation from the broader business of classroom learning. Uh, which was actually sold to a, a different private equity group. Now, in 2018, the rankings itself, we actually see an attempted purchase by Elsevier, uh, which we will get into, who has been heavily involved in data and analytics and content. Uh, but it was ultimately sold to Inflection, which was another private equity firm. And here we actually see this uh, combination of uh, uh, co data analytics and uh, consulting as the THE has moved to acquire the knowledge partnership and education consultancy, as well as inside higher education uh, for its capacity for data access. A bit more detail on those two. Next slide. We see here a emphasis on data and on insight as a part of the ability to extract from universities, uh, offering their capacity to combine their data sources and their information to improve uh, their capa okay. capacity to uh, consult on issues. And with the higher education, while well, it appeared at first to be uh, on the uh, THE side, just the claim to increasing their content ability, you see from the even the higher education uh, press release, the emphasis on extensive data points from universities globally, which really demonstrates this issue of data lakes and data access and consulting that comes overall. This sets the stage for uh, which note, however, just a quick a side note on a QS rankings, which have been doing something very different. Uh, they are also having some data involvement, but they've been really focusing on a, a recruitment with their recent acquisitions, which is why uh, we're talking about a THE more so as well as uh, Elsevier, as we can see from the next uh, slide. So in terms of Elsevier, the recent uh, discussions of Elsevier's mergers and acquisitions in the field as it moved beyond content and into analytics is really shown in the uh, academic knowledge production process, including the purchase of not only Pure and SciVal for analytics, but also the purchase of um, products such as SSRN for research social media, as well as various other products in this uh, graph. This is heavily tied uh, to both the content, which it leverages as a combination, but also uh, 
rankings, as we shall see in the next slide. But before we get into that, the, this graph itself is a bit dated. It's from 2019 with some more recent acquisitions uh, by Elsevier in the health, education, and life sciences field, because it is a large business with various subsidiaries, which creates an open question of how much of these acquisitions are in separate businesses versus uh, the question of a capacity building, because when you have purchases such as Cybite, a uh, semantic analytics that was mostly focused on oncology and practitioners, but you also see at the same time Elsevier's own products such as the fingerprint engine on the research end, which they have repeatedly promoted in their press releases, it is often uh, questionable to what degrees these purchases relate to one another. And it's at least hard to tell on my end. Definitely an interesting question for uh, further research. This gets us into the issue of the combination of rankings, analytics, and content. And we see this with the timeline of Elsevier's rankings involvement uh, from their early launch of Scopus in 2004, which is around the same time as the launch of the QSTHE rankings. Then they were using Web of Science, which was what everybody was using. But you see this aggressive involvement as Elsevier begins sponsoring these IREG events and actually uh, negotiations that caused the switch to Scopus. This allows for the promotion through rankings of analytics and data because of Scopus's rise as a new product. Now, THE split and actually returns to using uh, Web of Science as a part of their uh, response to the uh, much of the criticism of the uh, ranking methodology at the time as a way of bringing about legitimacy. But even then, they actually switched back a few years later in 2014, which really shows Elsevier's aggressive involvement and uh, in rankings. And this involvement in terms of the back end uh, on uh, the data being used and analytics is um, also seen in the front end as they publish an ebook discussing analytics and rankings and they present at uh, uh, these ranking summits to promote their products and they emphasize this repeatedly culminating in their 2008 attempt to bring in-house THE. Uh, which, again, uh, failed because of the uh, uh, ultimate purchase by inflection of private equity group. Uh, now, after that, we see this move on to 2020, and we saw the Dutch deal, which bundled the journal access and publishing. On this note, the recent JISC deal is, is very interesting as there are a lot of details that we do not know and that we should be uh, interested in looking into, uh, or someone in the audience who might know might be able to comment more on this. And it is especially interesting, these large scale deals, because of their ability to set precedent. The Dutch deal was frankly, heavily criticized for their combination of analytics and, and data. And it was very interesting how these new deals may be a response to that. Uh, covering this end, we finally move on to addressing the, with the next slide, uh, the, the, the question of Web of Science. And uh, Web of Science has not done as aggressive a uh, involvement in these key commercial rankings as Elsevier, which has really gotten involved in the two dominant rankings of QS and THE. But even then, they are also a business because Clarivate um, owns the journal Impact Factors, and they too have been repeatedly moved around by various private equity groups, uh, though ultimately with the most recent merger with Churchill Capital, it's uh, technically now a public firm. Uh, so we, we should probably stop calling them private equity at this point. <laughs> uh, it's a, just uh, big companies more generally. Uh, next slide. Uh, which brings us to the last issue of um, Clarivate's movement on 
uh, the, the content and more analytics as they recently acquire ProQuest. This improves uh, their analytics and really showcases the tie further with data uh, and content by giving them access to databases of full text. But it also puts into question the, the, the main claims of source neutrality, as it is interesting whether they still have the same incentives of being a uh, uh, open quote, um, neutral, close quote, if they also own a company that has a database consisting of specific articles and content. And this, again, demonstrates the benefits of the consolidating on all these fronts. And we really see it with these purchases, with Elsevier, and this has significant macro implications. Let's see. Oh, uh, I, so before I, I, I wrap up with some uh, implications, maybe I can supplement by say, uh, saying that for those of you not familiar with ProQuest, it is a library service vendor. It provides all the library searches, indexings, discovery tools for libraries. My library uses it. Many big libraries around the world use it. They have a huge market share uh, of higher education uh, library. Uh, and, uh, and again, coming back to higher education concerns, uh, of course, in recent year, we see, like, again, this very strong focus on productivity research output, and of course, publications and, and platforms for data uh, archiving and all that. And of course, uh, the, the administrations are very, very concerned about so-called strategic planning and international reputation. So these kind of three pillars uh, of, of, of concerns that uh, concerns higher education administrators uh, at the current time and Elsevier being a good business that they are is it been able to offer services to all these concerns. So they, they offer research management tools as you know, with pure SciVail fingerprints, engines, and all those kind of uh, infrastructural uh, tools for data uh, and research management. Of course, they are publishing uh, house uh, with lots and lots of journals and coming up with new journals all the time. Uh, uh, and, and, and last but not least, they are also a consulting service. They self consulting intellig research intelligence based on those data that they have been able to extract and sell them back to the university. And so, 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 so they are able to build this very close system of extractions using their own uh, access to the very strong content and infrastructure who then uh, uh, become very attractive to university who wants to do well in the ranking. So this is a pretty much a, a system that, that, that has questionable uh, uh, um, relationship within. Uh, a few days ago, I saw this tweet from uh, uh, Dr. Brankovich who's been studying rankings a lot as well. Of course, this particular slide uh, is, is rhetorical, right? Is, 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 could, the, could the referee uh, be the coach at the same time? What kind of conflict or tension uh, would that arise? Uh, and I would go further uh, by suggesting that not only the referee and the coaches are the same people, but that these same people also make up the rules of the games. So if you wanna play in the field, you actually play by the playbook and they will sell you the playbook in order to do well in that game. So this is a very, very tangled relationship. And I'm glad that there are people who are now looking, and many more people looking into these tangled relationships. Again, recently this article in, interestingly enough, in Times Higher Education uh, by Amy Brand, who's a director of MIT Press, that express concerns about very, very much the issues that we have outlined in this talk so far. And the last sentence that she mentioned there is that these kind of contractual relationships uh, even give uh, these company the right to explore, exploit university generated content and data for other business purposes outside of higher education, right? And so the, 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 the question is like, who are having oversight uh, of these kind of relationships? Uh, and who who has uh, who are signing these deals and and who are asking questions? Uh, who benefit from these deals really ultimately? Uh, and who who suffers from these deals? Um, and who has oversight of, of of these digital platforms and all the algorithms that they generate? 
and, and how what can we do about it as public institutions uh, and and as as uh, uh, people who are producing uh, the data and doing all the work on behalf of these companies? What roles can we play? Uh, and uh, who who are the higher education leaders who are asking these questions? And again, I'm throwing this out <laughs> into the into the open uh, because I, I don't know exactly the answer. Uh, but I also want to kind of play around with a couple of uh, analogies and the top two bullet there uh, that there are many forms of new rent seeking behavior uh, using higher education uh, as the site of extraction and rent seekings are now takes on many different forms and I'm using these old fashioned ideas of a landlord as a, as really just an analogy, but a place in the ranking is very much a rented space. Uh, and this rental space is very expensive uh, and increasingly so, but the minute you stop paying the rent, uh, your place in that hierarchy uh, may be, uh, may not be there. So uh, I just wanna leave uh, at this point and again, um, Thank you everybody for, uh, for your attention and thank you, George, for your collaboration uh, and your patience over the years. Thank you. And thank you all three for bringing forward such a fascinating set of problems for us to grapple with. Um, thank you, Ellen. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you, George. Uh, I mean, many of us, I think, would, would argue that, um, you know, knowledge is socially produced, you know, under any circumstances, it's, a pro it's not the product of a sort of pure mental process in, in the heads of individuals, but it's, it's constructed and understood socially. Um, but many of us would also argue that it's best if it's controlled by the knowledge producers as far as possible, working collectively, uh, that our model has its flaws, it has its closures, it has, it has its character as elite, uh, rich country, male and white um, dominated, but, but it's, it's better than all the other alternatives. Unfortunately, the other alternatives are now coming into play almost week by week. Uh, we've all been talking about the effects of geopolitics um, on research collaboration and cooperation, how that's com compromising, for example, relationships between researchers in China and, and the English speaking countries and Europe. Um, and, and, uh, uh, and look what's happening in Russia and Ukraine now to science and, and research cooperation. Um, but now we've also got to grapple with the way in which the commercial world is constructing and shaping knowledge, installing a system of incentives and one that governs the behavior of individual scientists and, and uh, uh, collectively and, and uh, as well as singly. And in, in these circumstances, how can we untangle, you know, the world of knowledge production in such a way as to open up um, legitimate science and knowledge to a larger set of human produced information and knowledge, uh, which is what we've been talking about a lot in this webinar series, you know, how can you unpick these commercial incentives to get them to respond to the need to bring in uh, the global south languages other than English, disciplines which are which are undervalued in the world knowledge system and so on. Um, let me ask you one question and then I'm going to pass to Phil back next. Um, my question is really about the um, the failed promise of uh, of um, of open access. I wish, could you say a little bit more about why it's not working out? Because I think many of us are, are going through currently new open access phase in which we're told that um, new open access arrangements will um, make knowledge much more broadly available. Why isn't it happening? I'm not sure which of you would like to answer that, but I'll hand that back to you to sort. I, I can start if you mm -hmm. if that's okay. Yeah, you told us. So, uh, uh, I, as I briefly alluded to, I think there's a there's a distorted definition of open access as being now uh, dominating the conversation. Uh, open access essentially is about barrier-free access to uh, academic product knowledge, uh, and uh, it is supposed to be cost uh, cost-free and permission-free. Uh, 
access. Uh, but uh, the publisher has been very clever and say, okay, well, we won't charge the reader for it, but someone has to pay for it. So we'll charge the producer, uh, the author side for, for this. And since the, since the funders uh, are funding the research anyway, why not out the funders and the institutions to, to pay upfront for these uh, production costs? Now, there's some validity to that argument. The, the problem with that is that uh, the pricing structure of these kind of, of, of productions is not transparent, number one. And number two is that uh, there are other models of funding open access without letting the publishers decide what is the right model to go about. And so there are lots of other uh, community-driven models of open access. Uh, Latin America is the leader in the world of community-based open access supported by both public subsidies uh, and uh, la labor from the academic, academic communities. And they do very, very well in su sustaining a lot of nonprofit journals. But our journals, are, because over the years have been largely bought over and dominated by the commercial publishers, the agenda setting that I talked about, the norm setting that I talked about had shifted to them and so dictate the term of, of access. Uh, and so this is where the problem is, is who, who are making those terms uh, is uh, uh, in the in the global north particularly. It it's awful, like if it. I yeah, if I just might add one one point in there just to compliment Leslie's is the big deals that we have seen um, going on that have been negotiated. They basically um, involve the five big um, publishers. Mm. And that really ties everyone into not just um, purchasing them, but publishing in those journals that are controlled by those. So you've got a narrowing of the academic um, arena. And, and that also is, that's another set of issues that are coming on it. So the issue of open access is not quite what we thought it was going to be. And that's obviously because the publishers are seeking to recoup the funds that they would have lost from the subscription model which previously went and now we have this but it's also a way of accumulating data mm. and, and boycotting the major publishers is more difficult than boycotting the, oh, the major definitely. rankings i mean it's just you know you just you harm yourself by doing so can i bring in phil all back at this point phil yes um thank you very much this is an amazingly important and interesting uh topic and even for those those of us who've been down the rabbit hole for many years, sort of thinking about some of these issues, uh, it's complicated and new and uh, the rapidly changing um, uh, landscape. And so it's really important that you guys are um, uh, focusing on this. So thank you very much. Um, I have two questions. One of them is, um, uh, ha having served as a journal editor for more than 25 years of high impact uh, journals in social sciences um, and education, uh, I'm wondering how, if, if there's a difference between the sort of knowledge creation uh, aspect and what both journal editors and authors sort of think about, you know, what they're going to research on and so on. Uh, and the whole area that you guys have been discussing, that is the you know, distribution and ownership of the distribution products. In my experience, and I'd be really interested to hear uh, Simon talk about this because I am not a, a currently an editor and he is, um, uh, that these, these issues that we're discussing today are not on the minds either of editors particularly, or of, uh, uh, of authors, at least in the fields that I've been working in. So um, maybe there needs to be kind of a bifurcation in the discussion between those of us who are producing uh, and even evaluating um, knowledge on the front line uh, and the sinister forces, which you've so well described uh, uh, on, on the other aspect. And my second question, which probably is beyond the scope of this discussion and maybe your expertise as well, is uh, the, uh, China is now um, making some efforts to distance itself from both the rankings and from 
the, the, the uh, citation indexes and so on and so forth. It, um, how extensive is that and will it work? So two, two kind of big questions. And thank, again, thank you very much for the research. Over to Leslie. Yeah. I, I thought part of the question was directed at Simons as well, as in terms of journal editor. Um, oh, no, look, I think we start with the panel. I mean, and I'll say yeah. okay. Uh, so, uh, well, let's face it. You know, being an editor uh, in chief, particularly, uh, is a prestigious position, particularly for. Uh, uh, a well-known journal. And uh, there's a lot of talk about, you know, uh, editorship and uh, and just the close group of editors uh, that historically has not been very uh, inclusive in terms of uh, who's who can take part in these kind of position of power uh, and who's 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 excluded. And I think there's a lot more reflection on this kind of uh, uh, if you will, gatekeeping structure. Now, publishers are very smart and recruiting uh, the the powerful people to to legitimize their brand. So they pick the rep, you know reputable scholars uh, to be editors and and so forth, uh, and so that they legitimize the the journals and people then don't think about the commercial side of it as much as as the intellectual side of it. But uh, I know a lot of journal editors are increasingly pressured by the publishers to, well, make sure that you have more of your, uh, uh, your network published in our journals, to increase citations, to increase uh, circulations, to increase uh, uh, ultimately the journal impact factor. And these are the kind of uh, cartels that, uh, that we're talking about. You know, not only data cartel, but citation cartels that, that, that are fairly well known. So, so these are power structure in and of itself that needs to be uh, part of the, the questioning. Um, and and it, that, is, that is increasing happening. Uh, with regard to China, I've also been following uh, uh, fairly closely. And China, of course, uh, have very specific uh, strategies 20 years ago when they, they, when, uh, when they set up their own Shanghai ranking, uh, which is to declare that they want to be part of this global game of, uh, of, of reputation uh, of competition. Uh, but once they have achieved a certain status and power themselves, uh, they want now to set their own rules. Uh, and I think in, in uh, Australasia regions, China's political, geopolitical power and globally as well, uh, are much different from there were 20 years ago where they have to play by a different set of rules now, they would have say, well, they can set their own rules as well. Uh, that's my take on, on, on China's uh, recent uh, development. And just to briefly respond to Phil, I mean, I, mean, I think that um, we're fortunate in higher education and that we're relatively protected by having a publisher who's worked closely with us for many years uh, and understands the kind of academic sensibility very well. So some of the more, um, I suppose, absurd um, commercial demands, commercially driven demands that the publisher makes from time to time get sort of modified or fielded or ignored, but it's a fine, a fine balance a lot of the time. And we've talked at times about, you know, withdrawing altogether. Um, from a, as an editorial group because of the way in which certain developments, certain pressures push us away from academic judgment and towards serving interests of the publisher. But um, I mean, I, I mean, I'm, I have a sense that the publishers are getting closer to the editorial process year by year. And um, the new model that one publisher, one of the five has developed in social science, which is to have uh, essentially a factory style production of, of a sort of generic social science journals, which are being not edited by academic editors, but managed from within, um, you know, by tertiary trained personnel within, within, within the company um, and, um, uh, and, and operating on, on essentially on a more accessible, less selective basis, um, you know, could, could completely undermine the social science uh, validity of uh, you know, of a lot of what we do. So, I mean, there are all kinds of problems coming down the line, I think, but, um, you know, really 
how do you know how do we find our way out of this you know out of the rabbit hole as it is um i i don't have any answers in this um, in this webinar anyway but we've got a number of people who want to come into the conversation and i think i'm going to have to bring people in in bunches um uh, be, to try and get as many voices heard as possible so we'll begin with Jelena Brankovic and David Locke, if you could each say something, and we'll ask our panel to respond. Jelena first, please. Thank you, Simon. Thank you, everyone, for um, thank you the presenters for the lovely, lovely um, presentation. I have a question that is actually uh, maybe a little bit more peripheral to the debate, but to what extent is, is, is the picture of the world varied in this respect? To what extent the Elsevier is, is actually managing to to, to sell its services to different parts of the world? Are there any, any, any countries that stand out? Do we maybe have any kind of information about particular kind of institutions that are more likely to buy the services? Is it just about uh, you know, having the resources or is it also about some other characteristics that could make certain kind of institutions, countries, regions more likely to be uh, receptive of this sort of business approach? I do understand that the data on this is, of course, not, not really available, but what is your impression? Thank you. Okay, hold that question and we'll bring in David Locke as well. Thank you very much. The Magna Carta Universitatum, which has now been signed by over 950 leading universities around the world, its first principle asserts that the university is an autonomous institution at the heart of society and specifically, and I quote, uh, to meet the demands of the world around it, its research and teaching must be morally and intellectually independent of all political authority and economic power. The impression I gain from the presentation is that what's happening actually sits very uncomfortably with this. And I'm wondering what universities should be doing about it to maintain their autonomy. I guess I'll just uh, quickly uh, comment on the question of uh, who's buying the data and services in any types of regions. I think th there's just, uh, well, first, much of this is not public except for those that specifically they use as a part of their advertising. Though consulting firms may know much more than we do on who's using what. I do think that in a, there is a interplay between the degree to which the uh, national governments are interested in these types of performances, as well as the universities which are uh, connected to one another. That's one aspect, but also the degree to which uh, certain countries may want to increase their academic uh, reputability or prestige, because now that we have rankings, this may be a way of increasing your recognition through rankings and this might be an avenue of engagement as even with Leslie mentioning the whole Shanghai rankings and competing internationally as a way of building up uh, the recognition and uh, status of countries uh, such as China back then and potentially more countries in the future who would want to take this as an avenue of pointing towards objective measures uh, so, but of course you do need some money, presumably, uh, to participate uh, and some willingness and interest. Yeah, Lena, I just want to come back to your question about who used their services. Uh, I, I, I'm familiar with a number of uh, institutions uh, uh, in Africa, for example, uh, where uh, Elsevier and other STM publisher regularly provide workshops on how to increase their productivity citation uh, and uh, contribute to university reputation. And then they will go to the vice pro provost chancellors and say, we can help you write your strategic plan. We can make sure that your university was not ranked anywhere in the world, will become ranked number 2050, you know, within the next two years. And this is how you're gonna go about doing it. We will help you do it. Uh, and, you know, you can start publishing in our journals and we'll start doing all these kind of things, uh, so forth. So these kind of consulting services are, are offered regularly. Now, they may offer it for free even to get them hooked. Uh, and then once they're hooked, then 
then and then the money comes in right uh so so the extent exact extent we, we're trying to track but they're here and there we can you know it would be nice to compile a database and that will be part of a kind of futures research that we would like to do um and as far as other countries are concerned i know in the uk uh, a lot of them already buy into it deep deeply and um uh, ellen mentioned other chapters in the handbook and i think there's a chapter by miguel lim uh, that mm. document very specifically about the use of uh, uh elsevier product uh, at their university and many uk university are very very deeply uh, embedded or have their research uh, services and consulting embedded uh, i know my university actually have someone that used to work in those companies that are now working in our research office, advising our research office how to game those analytic companies. So it's very tangled. Yeah, um, if I might just raise a, raise a further point on don't it. Don't forget um, David Locke's question. Yeah, I'll come back to David's point. Um, it's important, to, I think, to realize, I mean, governments and everyone needs data. You can't run a system without knowing where you are and in order to plan where you're going. It's just, and the ability to collect the data is really complicated. Rankings are simply at this stage a vehicle for collecting the data through the partnership. Getting a rise in data in rankings is part of it, but it's not the whole picture. Rankings are a hugely resource intensive exercise and it's the consulting and the data warehousing, that's really where the money is. And that's the whole, and the point is, is that there's virtually no government around for obvious and necessary reasons that doesn't need a higher education management information system. It's just not, and no institution nowadays can operate without the data either. Mm -hmm. And it's a simple issue of reality that yes. we've allowed um, public data to be privatized. There is no international collection of data, data definitions. There's no data um, database. And um, within what you might call public type organizations, be that UNESCO, be that even OECD, be that any of these kinds of international organizations. And hence, that's what we, we have now is the privatization of public data. Right. Yeah. Uh, David's question raises exactly those points with regard to open science that Leslie spoke about earlier. And it's a difficulty because the universities can't work, run either without high level strategic data. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely, Alan. I'm glad you, you emphasized the importance of, of data, having uh, data to, to base decisions on. Uh, and the issue here is about governance. Uh, and the modes of extraction, right? And and who have oversight and who designed a system in the first place to collect those data for what purpose? If the data were collect in order to maximize certain kind of business decision, would the data be useful for us in making educational decision and pedagogical decisions? I would I would think a lot of time they don't they don't align. And so, but then we're being asked to follow those advice based on those data that are not designed to help us think about our, our jobs, so to speak. So, so yeah, uh, so governance, uh, uh, how we can take better part in the governance of our own labor and the, the, the data that are generated from that labor and the, the data generated from our students. I haven't mentioned the part, I mean, I've broadly alluded to the infrastructural dominance, but most of our university are also now dependent on privatized infrastructure, right? All the lab learning management system, the one that we use Canvas, it's owned by another private equity firm uh, in structure, right? And they are in the risk business, they're in the insurance business about risk assessment. And so can risk assessment decision be the one that we're using to drive our pedagogical decisions? Unfortunately, that's how we become entangled um we've uh, run out of time i fear uh i i've got a long list of people waiting to come in um but um my, i might just take one 
we usually run to about five past. Um, Lisa Hinchcliffe, can you come in please with your question? Hello, Lisa. If we have no Lisa, I'm going to ask Morton Hansen to come in. Hi, uh, thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. Uh, I was taken by Leslie's idea that uh, universities pay rent to be on the rankings. Uh, do we know what are the concrete ways in which uh, universities pay rent? Um, so where is money being ex exchanged and for what services? Uh, and perhaps are some more important for others from uh, a profit perspective or from a revenue perspective? Thank you. Okay, who would like to pick that up? George, you wanna say anything or you want me to start? You can start, I'll add some detail into it as okay. you go. Well, so the examples that we, we mentioned in terms of these, uh, the pay to publishing deals, these, these so-called article processing charges uh, uh, that then are packaged into these uh, library subscription deals uh, the library subscription deals was already a, a form of rent payment, right? You, you literally license the content. And the minute you stop licensing the content, your library stop having access, right? Uh, same thing with these publishing deals, right? So you're constantly paying the rent to these, these company because the minute you stop paying, you don't have any services uh, and you don't even own anything after that, right? And that's the whole point. In the past, we used to actually own the collections, but now you don't even own that. So that's what I mean by, by rent. And, and they're very clever in turning more and more things into rentable rentable assets, right? Uh, and and uh, open uh, assets publishing is a, a clear example. But again, there are, there are these, these analytics and all these kind of things that they dangle and so forth uh, that you want to pay for because they will get you to a better place. Uh, those are all very important uh, way they nudge you. It's almost like the old uh, cable TV business model where a lot of the payments are indirect. The advertisers are paying the uh, TV producers who are sending the content to the cable, which is going out for free. But then through advertising, it's, it's, it's a lot of indirect cycles of payments ultimately become rent. There, there are direct payments such as uh, consulting or work alongside the uh, a lot of the student faculty data or other forms of data submissions or potentially reputation advising those are frankly not as substantial when compared to much of these indirect payments that are being moved around and these payments into analytics and uh, infrastructure mm -hmm. as well as content that are necessary to compete and, and th so the data extraction is just not on the research side, but also on the student side, right? So tracking students, entries, graduation rate, uh, and employment successes, all these kind of things are data that can be packaged as part of the understanding of the institution, uh, you know, within a business context. Like, is this business, is this, is this university a good investment uh, opportunities, right? Uh, and, and all the university in the top one anyway uh, are being rated by the credit company. My, my university have a triple A ratings, by the way. Uh, so is Harvard and, and, and Oxford. So. <laughs> Congratulations on the triple A ratings. <laughs> uh, I, I think we'll have to call a halt. Um, I'm, I must apologize to, to David Mills, uh, to Paolo Contreras, Shilda Rayleigh, uh, Stephen Curry, and Vladislav Popov. Uh, I would have really liked to have brought you in, but. There's just so much substance in this discussion and uh, we just don't have enough time today. Well, clearly, we need to return to these issues. We, they're really important. I mean, they're shaping everything else, aren't they? So um, we will do so. Uh, and, and, and congratulations to Ellen and Georgiana for bringing forward such an important book um, and you know, containing so much critical material in it. Uh, getting that through the publishing process. Um, <laughs> maybe something we can't take for granted forever. Um, uh, but you know, really valuable, and uh, so I, you know, I urge you to take the discount offer and uh, for your library if you can, uh, and get access to 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 the handbook. Um, thank you, Ellen and Leslie and George. Today, I thought you did really, really well to bring those issues forward so clearly, um, and you know, you all 
all, all three of you, of course, welcome to return to our webinar program whenever you've got something you want to bring forward to the higher education community on a global basis. You know, we, we, we're a facility you should use to make these critiques heard as widely as possible. We're finding that on YouTube, our um, webinars are being used more extensively than they are on the day. And today we had almost 100 people closely engaged in this conversation. Our next um, webinar, which will be next Tuesday, takes us to a historical view of um, using essentially um, long, um, economic his historical data uh, from France and the UK since the 1920s, looking at long-term trends in, in inward student mobility, transformation of staffing uh, and other indicators. Um, it's actually really interesting material and it'll be presented to us by Vincent Carpentier. So we look forward to that next Tuesday. Um, it just remains for me to say thank you all for attending and thank you very much again to Ellen Leslie and George. Bye for now. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Ellen. Thanks, Georgina. Thanks, uh, Simon. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, George.